Police. They circled people while yelling anti-Semitic slurs at them. Now, anti-Semitic attacks are rattling the Jewish community. And there were growing reports of anti-Semitic attacks and slurs. After a sharp increase in anti-Semitic attacks. It's a string of hate crimes. Most He's knocked out and breaks his ankle. I'm square by people taking part in a pro-Palestinian. Police say men wearing Palestinian flags attacked Jewish diners outside a sushi restaurant. Witness. And then punching him across the head, knocking him to the ground. Man was punched in the head in what police described. This panel is called Rainbow Maccabees, the LGBTQ plus Jews leading the fight against Jew hate. And the first few people I told the title to, all people close to me, all said, Jew hate. Don't you think that's a little strong? There's always hope at the end of a rainbow. Good evening, everyone. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to you. Whether in Israel or around the world, as Jews, we are all members of one big family. We are connected by shared history and values, as well as our hope for a better future. So when a member of the family is harmed, Jews everywhere are affected. As the dark and ever-growing shadow of anti-Semitism persists, the diaspora communities need a diverse, robust, and courageous coalition of leaders to inspire them to action. That is what tonight is all about. Being a Rainbow Maccabee comes with the responsibility to assume these leadership roles. You, who are advocating for what you believe in, particularly when it comes to Jewish and LGBTQ plus rights, often witness hate firsthand. Too many Jewish activists, like those speaking tonight, have been subjected to personal threats and attacks just for being proud of who they are. That is why I'm especially honored to take part in this event tonight, to meet all of you, speakers and participants alike, and see your commitment to being at the forefront of the fight against anti-Semitism, discrimination, and bigotry. It is not easy work, but it is necessary. I wish us all much success in this important cause. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Minister Roll. It's an honor to have you join us. We're here tonight to talk about anti-Semitism. And in particular, we're here to highlight the amazing leadership of LGBTQ plus Jews in fighting anti-Semitism. A remarkable number of our bravest, most powerful, and most effective advocates against anti-Semitism are LGBTQ plus activists. In addition to the three amazing panelists we have tonight, Ben Freeman, Blake Flayton, and Eve Barlow, there is Barry Weiss, who left her job as a columnist at the New York Times because of anti-Semitism there, and has taken that cause into a fight for free speech through various organizations that she believes will ultimately lead to better conditions for Jewish people. There's Chen Mazik, who has become a go-to for Jewish opinions in mainstream sources that don't normally seek them out. In Canada, there's Shai DeLuca, there's Raphael Gans, and there are too many more to mention. 
I'm here at my own home shul, Kehillat Beth Israel. Just recently, my son was bar mitzvahed here. I was bar mitzvahed at the predecessor shul to this one. My father was bar mitzvahed at the grandfather shul to this one. Even for non-religious Jews or Jews living non-religious lives, the shul has a very important central place to us because many of the most important things in our lives happen here. For religious Jews, the shul is a key part of their Jewish life. But for non-religious Jews, the shul is also a key part of our Jewish life. Here, we are in the sanctuary of the shul. But as we saw this weekend, with the horrible events in Texas, and as we've known for a long time, shuls are not a sanctuary. Our shuls are guarded. On the high holidays, we have armed police outside. Many of our shuls have bollards protection against car attacks or gates. And in Texas this weekend, at a bar mitzvah, we saw the ultimate invasion. And so the shul represents not only a symbol of our Jewish life, but it's also a metaphor for the way we are under siege. Our panelists tonight are going to help us understand the problem and help us understand what we can do about it. I'd like to introduce, first of all, Eve Barlow. Uh, Eve is a Scottish freelance music journalist. She's based in LA. She was a is a top notch, top of her game journalist who has bylines in New York Magazine, The Guardian, The Los Angeles Times, Pitchfork, Variety, GQ, and many more. She was one of the Alg Miners top 100 people positively influencing Jewish life. Uh, during the Corbin era, Eve became a voice for Jews against the increasing anti Semitism of the progressive left. She grew a huge social media following. But with that, she took some of the worst, most disgusting attacks of any online personality. Eve, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to meet you. We're also joined tonight by Blake Flayton. Blake is originally from Arizona. He's a recent graduate of George Washington University. Congratulations. Blake is the founder of the New Zionist Congress, or co-founder, I should say, which is a grassroots organization focused on reclaiming space from anti-Semitism, especially on college campuses, and with a unique focus on Jewish pride. His op-ed in the New York Times two years ago as a student exposed the devastating environment for university students. He has also been listed as one of Algemeiner's top 100 people positively influencing Jewish life. And he has been at the forefront of a new wave of more vocal Jewish youth leadership and he is currently the new media director and a weekly opinion columnist for Jewish Journal. Blake, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Lastly, for lastly I am very proud to introduce Ben M. Freeman. Ben has been uh, my own go-to contact for quotes whenever I need to understand something going on in the political world of anti-Semitism for the last two years. He is a uh, leader, a thinker, and an educator. His first book, Jewish Pride, Rebuilding a People, is a manifesto that has started a movement. He's working on his second book, Do This Year, on a critical topic we're going to be talking about later on, internalized anti-Semitism. Ben is Scottish-born. He's living in Hong Kong. He's an internationally known educator in anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, and a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant. Uh, Ben also came to prominence during the Corbyn fight the, or the Labour Party Jew hatred crisis of 2018 as one of the leading Jewish voices uh, against Corbyn in Britain. Ben, great to see you again. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're going to start the conversation tonight by talking about the basics, anti-Semitism 101. So, Ben, I'd like to ask you, first of all, tell us what is anti-Semitism and where does it come from? It's quite a difficult question. I mean, I would say that anti-Semitism or Jew hatred is an ideology. It is an ideology that's baked into many different societies, specifically the Christian world and the Muslim world. And it is thousands of years old. And I mean, literally thousands of years old. And that is something that people really fail to understand today. 
people try to understand what we're experiencing. You know, we saw those slides that were shown at the beginning of these kind of horrific incidents that are taking place across the world all the time and being targeted at Jews. And we try to understand it by looking at today. But we really have to go back in history. We have to go back to the Roman conversion to Christianity. We have to go to the Roman accusation that the Jews killed Jesus, the accusation that Judas sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And those are the historic roots. And there's many people who try to classify Jew hatred very specifically. They'll say it's a racial form of hatred. It's a religious form of hatred. It's political. And the reality is it's all of those things. It is something that can permeate every single strata of society. It's something that can that can permeate every single ideology in the world. And we see it really throughout the world. We see it in Asia. We see it in Africa, in Europe, of course, North America, South America. Um, and it's really in every single society. And I say the non-Jewish world hates Jews. And that's not to say that every single non-Jewish person in the world hates Jews, rather the ideologies, the values, the societies that represent the diaspora really are, they were founded in opposition to Jews. And that's really what it is. We have to understand it from a very deep perspective. It isn't just disliking Jews. That ideology that I spoke about was, is a conspiracy fantasy. Ideas of Jews are used to make sense of the world. So it has nothing to do with us, though it obviously, as we know, impacts our lives very directly. Thanks. Uh, Eve, can you talk about modern anti-Semitism and in particular the different places that anti-Semitism is coming from today that are threatening us? Sure. I mean, again, it's a pretty... Um, Pretty massive open-ended question but you know anti-semitism exists i think that the most important thing to emphasize is that anti-semitism exists regardless of you know political corners it's across the spectrum and what we see happening and especially what i've been involved in bashing away and, and combating is the the way in which jews have become a political football for either side so um, the non-Jewish world, if you like, are selective over the anti-Jewish racism and the anti-Semitism that they choose to be outraged by when, in fact, they should be concentrating on the ways in which anti-Semitism appears in our institutions and our systems across the board. For me, I, I you know, in terms of a daily basis, the, the place where I see most anti-Semitism is online, but that's not limited to online because... What we've seen even just this past weekend is that violent words lead to violent acts and the two uh, talk to each other all the time. You know, it's no coincidence that during the mass production and distribution of lies on the Internet and in the mainstream media during the war against Hamas last May, there was a vast spike in increased anti-Semitic attacks across the diaspora. So again, these two things talk to each other. Um, I would say at the moment, you know, my focus really is on the, the prescient anti-Semitic rhetoric that exists in far left spaces because I didn't come from a far left space, but I came from progressive spaces and it was therein that I saw a hypocrisy with people who claim to be about morally righteous causes and um, you know, liberalism, and who have this screaming blind spot when it comes to anti-Jewish bias that that spoke that spoke to me of um, a great you know a great sense of betrayal, but also uh, a great worry in terms of the flaw in their in their fight, and it, it really questioned for me the authenticity in in the hearts and minds of those who participate in those movements. And I see that anti-Semitism existing in those spaces as, for me, the biggest threat because I, I witness how it discourages a lot of Jews from fighting back and it actually encourages those Jews to further assimilate into non-Jewish ideas of us and adopt an anti-Zionist stance in order to fit in with those worlds. And that's something that gravely concerns me. Um, Blake, could you 
continue on that thought on the different areas of modern anti-Semitism, but also uh, Eve said something really important that I know that you're gonna to wanna to talk about, and that's the hypocrisy and the double standards and how the world treats anti-Semitism. Could you address that? Yes, of course. Um, so in regards to your first question, <clears throat> excuse me, about anti-Semitism in our modern era, in contemporary times. Where does it come from? Where can we find it? Who does it come from? Um, I think there is a very strong association between anti-Semitism and illiberal ideologies. Ideologies that hold contempt and disdain for institutions of liberal democracy um, and really ideas that hold contempt for the values that come from liberal democracy, um, like meritocracy, like freedom of speech, like academic freedom, um, like gender equality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Jews have often uh, been portrayed or at least been treated as a proxy for these institutions. So whenever the Jews are attacked, we've all heard the canary in the coal mine uh, analogy. Um, it is a sign that our democratic institutions are in fact themselves under attack. Um, and by the way, we've represented that freedom, that liberty since uh, uh, well, uh, right after our exodus from Egypt when uh, those in Egypt resented the Jews for liberating themselves from slavery. So this narrative has been with us for quite a long time. Today, there is illiberalism bursting out of every corner um, from the far farthest you can go left on the spectrum, obviously to the farthest you can go right and everywhere in between. Um, there is a rise in populism, there is a rise in anti-intellectualism, there is a rise in anti-establishmentism, um, and has been replaced with uh, conspiracy thinking um, and grievance politics. Um, and, and Ruth Weiss, uh, Professor Ruth Weiss, Professor of Yiddish Literature at Harvard and McGill, uh, sometimes refers to anti-Semitism as the politics of the pointing finger. And what do groups who are engage in grievance politics of yelling at people who disagree with them, of trying to tear down norms and, and, and usher in uh, revolutionary or reactionary ideas, what do they love to do? They love to point the finger at people because this is a great way to get people angry, which of course grows your coalition. Um, and for centuries, we have been on the opposite end of that pointing finger. Um, and that's what we're seeing today. Um, whether it be from the right, the left, radical Islamic movements, uh, what have you. Um, I think I forgot your second question. <laughs> oh, in regards to- um, Hypocrisy, the hypocrisies of dealing with uh, dealing- Yes. With so, versus other racisms. Of course. So one thing that uh, this answer tethers to the last um, is about, you know, the Jews are the pinpoint of accusations of blame which makes it different from other uh, forms of prejudice, anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry, which tend to punch down, um, tend to be dehumanizing, um, tend to be othering. And although anti-Semitism is of course these things, it is always framed in the anti-Semite's mind as speaking truth to power, as if uh, violence or hatred directed against the Jews is was their own doing. They brought it on themselves, and only by improving themselves could they ever expect to be free of this. Um, and so that is a, uh, a siren song uh, to a society um, which is increasingly, uh, you know, hyper focused on other forms of bigotry uh, as they should be, um, but doesn't really know what to make of a bigotry which portrays us as the victims of them. Um, and that's very hard for people to square. And that's why I think anti-Semitism is treated with, with, with such a hefty double standard. Um, yeah, in, in today's climate. Ben, uh, Blake mentioned the different place that the Jew takes in different movements minds. And I know you wrote an article about that in connection with Harry Potter. Can you explain a little bit about that article and that, that kind of theory of anti-Semitism? Yes, of course. I think it's that uh, people are probably often surprised at how often I reference Harry Potter in my work, but I actually think this is a really fantastic way of getting people to understand the contradictory nature of Juhi. And it's one I use for my students because when I was teaching my students the history of the Holocaust, they couldn't understand why it was so inherently contradictory. They were like, well, they said that we're white or we're not white or we're capitalist or we're communist. Why? It makes no sense. And that's really kind of the point. It is totally illogical and irrational. It's not rooted 
in rationale or logic at all. It's fantasy. And that one thing I will say is that makes it quite difficult for us as Jews to process because these things are being said about us, which have actually nothing to do with our reality, but they're being framed as our reality. So it's, we're really being gaslit constantly. But the um, analogy that I borrowed, I didn't create it, I borrowed from Harry Potter was the Bogart. So the Bogart is referenced in The Prisoner of Azkaban, the third book. And it's a magical creature that nobody knows what it looks like. And it takes the shape of whatever the individual looking at it fears most. So. Eve might see it in one way, Blake another, David you another, we'd all see different things. And that is the role the Jews play. Because it's again, it's not about us as Jews, it's about ideas of Jews. So if you're a society which is positioning itself against capitalism, well, the Jew can represent communism. If you're a society that is uh, is communist, you can frame the Jew as the capitalist. If you're a society which views kind of white people as the apex predators, then Jews are the Jews are, are white. If you're a society which views non which views non-white people as you know conspiring to bring down white society, then the Jews are not white. And I think it's really important that we understand Jew hate at its core. There's so many conversations happening, which, you know, and, and Eve really alluded to this, you know, it's always these conversations about which is worse, right? Is it left or is it right? Or is it Christian or is it Muslim? And the reality is all of these different forms share a common core. And they're all saying basically the same thing about us, just expressed in slightly different language. But yeah, the, uh, that that is the role the Jew plays. And again, we have to understand that it has nothing to do with us. And that's the difficulty because, you know, when we experience as a global Jewish family, the hostage situation at Beth, uh, Beth Israel in Texas, that does affect us. It has real life implications. But when we say Jew hatred is not a Jewish problem, this is what we're meaning. It's a problem that begins in the non-Jewish world and it impacts us. But most importantly, again, I'm going to reiterate, it has nothing to do with our reality. Thanks. Um, Eve, let's uh, address what is always the elephant in the room <laughs> and talk about the connection between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Okay, <laughs> I'll kick it off. I'm, I'm giving you the tough ones. Yeah, no, it's fine. I, you know, it's not, it's not tough for me because I have you, one of the reasons why I guess I'm so lambasted is because these ideas are very, have become very controversial because the word Zionism suddenly became very controversial. I mean, it wasn't sudden. It happened in 1975 when the UN declared that Zionism is racism, but that took a while to peter into the mainstream. And certainly when I was growing up, I never really thought about the word Zionism that much. And I was the chairperson of the local chapter of the Federation of Zionist Youth in Glasgow. And I kind of had a, I had a faint understanding of what the word Zionism means, but it wasn't really until I got to university and then during the, the rise of Corbyn that I, I really got a taste for how, I mean, that's putting it mildly, for how much the word Zionism had been bastardized in in a way that had become hugely popular and just and so far removed from the definition of the word and not just the definition of the word but the feeling of the word you know um the thing that ben, the way that ben has just talked about the the bogart in harry potter and the idea of how how a jew will present itself to someone in the way that they most fear I think it's really important to think about the effect that that's had on us as Jews as well, because despite the fact that it doesn't represent our reality, the further Jews have come away from their, their you know, deep understanding of their own story, their own history and their own identity, the more susceptible they are to maybe seeing versions of that Bogart themselves and actually listening and understanding and ingesting some of those biases. And that's essentially what's happened with anti-Zionism. You know, before I do any panels, I always say to people that I I'm fine to do a panel as long as there's no Holocaust deniers or anti-Zionists on the panel. And I think that was something that, that Ben used to say to me early on in this work as well, because essentially, you know, and I don't want to put words in Ben's mouth, but essentially to me, those two camps are the same. They're both conspiracy fantasists and they're both, they're both peddling an idea that is totally rooted in, in falsehood. And 
there has been no presentation of anti-Zionism to me that has been a positive definition that has given the, the movement, if you like, or the idea any weight. Because from everything that I have, have witnessed and been subjected to, anti-Zionism is just that. It's, it's against Zionism. And if Zionism is fundamentally at its core, really nothing beyond the right for Jewish people to self-determine in their homeland, then being against that is fundamentally racist, xenophobic and anti-Semitic. So it's blatant anti-Semitism in my book and, and it should be according to any Jewish person or any non-Jewish person who understands what the definition of Zionism actually is. Um, I forgot to mention something very cool, which is that you and Ben grew up together we did we each other from way back and went on in different paths in your lives and then somehow have have come together in this fight and i think that's that's a really incredible story um but to follow up on what you were talking about in terms of the um the twisting of the meaning of of zionism can you talk a little bit about your personal situation going back 2017 or so when the Corbin era, Corbin movement was becoming stronger, you were speaking out more. What was the reaction like among your social circle, your professional circle, and the the online reception that that you uh, received? Mm -hmm. I had I had been aware, obviously, of the rise of Corbin, and it had been in the back of my mind for some time. In 2017. I was actually not on the internet. I had quit all of social media. I decided it was just ego jousting and narcissism. And I, you know, was working in the music industry and I just didn't see a need to be on it. So I came off, but I came off leaving a huge audience and I deactivated my account, which means it's not permanently deleted. And around the summer of 2018, I got so antagonized and frustrated and honestly incredibly fearful about the prospect of Jeremy Corbyn actually winning the election that I decided to reactivate my account with the sole purpose of talking about Corbynism and anti-Semitism. So for my audience who had really never heard me talk about my Jewish identity before, suddenly see me back online after a year offline and I wasn't promoting the latest single by such and such indie star from Brisbane, Australia or whatever. Um, and I was talking in completely different language. I was constructing tweets like, like they were, you know, meditative missives about politics and identity and my, everything, everything about tone and subject was entirely different. And I used that opportunity because I, I saw the unique place that I held in the, in the conversation. I was, I was largely in front of an audience of people who would naturally think that Corbyn was a good guy and would vote for him. And I was in front of an audience of a lot of people who were campaigning for Corbyn and who were actively visibly mem um, participating in his in his public campaign and were were truly poster people for Jeremy Corbyn and and I I really recognized that among our echo chamber I was really the only person in music journalism with with a capacity to discuss these complex ideas in a nuanced way whereby I could inject myself into the conversation without being too aggressive or pointing fingers at people. And I really just with a purpose of trying to get people to think twice about what they were doing and to really take the issue of anti-Semitism seriously. And I was pleasantly surprised by the ways in which some people engaged and obviously incredibly heartbroken by the ways in which other people totally dismissed me. And, um, you know, December 12th of that year was, without being melodramatic, was one of the worst days of my life. You know, to see to see your entire industry, people you've known for 10 plus years, um, friends from university, 
everyone you kind of socially hung out with for your entire adult life, cheering on the man who was promoting Jew hatred within the ranks of Her Majesty's opposition party in, in the UK and, and excited to vote for this guy. It was, you couldn't look away, you know, it was, it was gut-wrenching and it really drew a line in the sand in terms of my life being a very much a before and after moment from that. Thank you. I, I mean, you've shown such incredible bravery in, in what you faced, you all have. Uh, it's a really incredible story. Let's change focus for a moment and get back to the theme of the night. And Blake, I will ask you, why are gay and lesbian activists so prominent as leaders against anti-Semitism? Hmm. I, this actually is not the first time I've been asked this question because I too have realized that there are quite a number of us involved in this effort. Um, to be honest, I think it might be because we are naturally more likely to be exposed to progressive spaces um, and therefore we are more likely to find fault and to see the flaws of said progressive spaces. Um, I always talk about the contradictions that I felt when I arrived on my college campus um, because I had been raised in a very political household, a very progressive household, but a very political household where argument and debate and discussion um, over the Shabbat dinner table were just expected and everyone was always playing each other's devil's advocate and trying to stump the other person or get them to think critically about a certain issue. And I think I can say the same about a lot of Jewish families. That's something that's very much in our DNA, which goes back to what I said previously about liberal democratic institutions and our relationship to them. Um, but, you know, um, in regards to, <laughs> and so I arrived on campus and experienced the complete opposite of that. Um, I encountered other queer people who I was very excited to become friends with, who I was very keen to be associated with, um, to attend political events with, um, and to volunteer for presidential candidates with, um, who held a, a view of leftism that you could not question, because if you did, it immediately put you outside of what um, scholar and sociologist David Hirsch calls the community of the good, right? Um, and that is a very emotionally uh, terrifying place to be. Um, because as Eve has uh, you know, testified, it can isolate you. It can leave you feeling abandoned and betrayed um, and homeless. Um, and it wasn't until much later I realized that those feelings of homelessness were actually quite common uh, throughout Jewish history and that, uh, that political wandering is in fact uh, the rule, not the exception. Um, and so that was you know, why I came in conflict with my progressivism and my queerness, um, if you will. It's because those values uh, clashed uh, very profoundly. Um, and I, I think I can say the same for others. Um, I, I uh, am openly gay and openly Jewish, um, public facing, um, which the, the implications of that are not lost on me um, because it's, you know, for, for a lot of Jews who have been involved in the Jewish community for a very long time, uh, it's different to see somebody who is very open about their identity, their sexual orientation. Um, and for um, those in the LGBTQ community, um, it is different to experience uh, activism um, on behalf of the Jewish people because religion is very taboo um, in those spaces. Um, and Zionism, for reasons that <laughs> we've already discussed and can discuss more, is extremely taboo. Um, so I feel like it's serving a purpose and I'm, I'm proud to deliver that. Uh, ben, can you expand on that and talk about what in your life experience, experience as an LGBTQ plus Jew and in your identity has informed or affected your activism? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I experienced the rejection of Jews on campus, I mean, what, 2020, so I'm 17 years ago, when I was, when I first went to university in 2005, and I was not yet out. I was, uh, I came out during my university um, career, I guess, and I remember when I came out, I was really embraced. People were really excited, people were really, they were really wanting to support me. And throughout that time, throughout my university degree, I was still, I was very involved in the Jewish community. 
and I was I was the only out Zionist at Glasgow University and Glasgow University is a major British university and I was being uh, harassed abused by my peers by professors and I was kind of the sole representative of of being an out Jew and Zionist on campus. So I experienced that. And then I experienced the contradiction. I experienced the absolute hypocrisy of how I was being treated when I came out. And I think that is, you know, Blake touched on this, but I think that is something that LGBTQ plus Jews feel very keenly. So for example, when I tell people that I'm gay, the first thing they say to me is, what are your pronouns? Um, are you gay? Are you queer? Are you LGBTQ plus? They want me to define my own identity. But when I tell people that as a Jew, I don't identify as white, although I understand that I benefit from the advantage of being perceived as white, I'm immediately told, no, that's incorrect. And I'm also told that by other Jews, which is a conversation I know we'll get to later. But that hypocrisy, you just can't ignore. And in my own life, you know, I want to say it. This is a really important event because LGBTQ Jews are some of the people leading this fight. And more than that, LGBTQ plus pride was the direct um, root of the modern Jewish pride movement. I would never have written Jewish pride rebuilding a people if I was not LGBTQ plus. I experienced my own pride journey. I did the work to dismantle my own internalized homophobia. I had to go on a journey. And all of that, all of the steps that I took informed what I put down on paper in Jewish pride rebuilding a people. And I do think that the Jewish community should acknowledge that, that not only are Jews, are LGBTQ Jews leading this fight, but we're also some of the ones leading this movement to rebuild, to inspire, to empower. And I think that's extraordinary. So for me, my LGBTQ plus uh, experience has directly informed my advocacy, my, my, my writing, everything that I do, because I see the world from different perspectives, or I experience the world rather would be more accurate from different perspectives. And yeah, I mean, it's, it is kind of remarkable that the modern Jewish pride movement is, is not only related to, is not only kind of like, you know, tangentially inspired by, it was directly rooted in gay pride. That is incredible. And it is something for our entire community to celebrate. And that's why this event is so important. I remember when you first approached me about this, I mean, it literally feels like forever ago, and I was so excited because it really feels that the community doesn't see us. We're a minority within a minority. And that means that we experience the world slightly differently. And it is really important that our community makes space for LGBTQ plus Jews and recognizes the role that we're playing, as I said, in fighting Jew hate and in inspiring a new generation. Um, Eve, can you talk about within the LGBTQ plus community, the widespread animosity to Israel as a Bogart and in terms of um, being even more radical than the radical left, it seems. Is this an activist thing or is this a real community-wide issue? Um, sure. I'd, I'd like to think that it's not a, a widespread community issue and that it's more related to LGBTQ plus activism. I, I don't actually have statistics to hand or any, you know, information that would say which it is, but other than knowing that I have, I still have some incredibly dear non-Jewish friends in the LGBTQ plus community who are disgusted by the way in which anti-Zionism has latched on to LGBTQ plus activism and, and they, they, they understand and they see how alienating that is for Jewish people. Um, but it doesn't go unnoticed by me how vehement the anti-Zionist stance is within the queer community among queer Jews. And I've often found myself in a philosophical mode wondering about this. And the reason is because it's actually, a, I would say, a phenomenon that's very close to my heart because it's very close to an almost experience I might have had. I came out very late. I came to my sexuality very late. And when I did so... One of the things I was angry about 
was the notion that perhaps my Jewish upbringing and my kind of enforced um, indoctrination against dating anyone non-Jewish in case it might, you know, eventually lead to me marrying out of the faith was somehow responsible for a kind of grand across the board repression of my sexuality and my ideas of romantic relationships. And in that mode, I, I drifted drastically further away from my Jewish roots and my Jewish community and really gave my, my put my life and my heart into the LGBTQ plus community and kind of free falls into that community in a way in which, because I was so welcomed. And I think Blake spoke very well to this before, as did Ben about, you know, the, the, the way in which he was so celebrated when he came out at Glasgow University and then so demonized when he would talk about his Zionism, there was there was something in me that felt like I was almost prepared to compromise anything in order to continue to be welcomed by these people because I was just so thankful that at such a vulnerable stage in my life, though there was this community who were established and loving and caring and would do anything to just make sure that I was safe and, that, and to make sure that I knew that I had chosen family. And I think about this a lot, you know, in the end, I, there was something in me and I think it was just my, my really strong, stubborn, rooted Jewish sense of identity that just refused to, to go quietly into the night um, that I just, I snapped out of it at one point and really during the Corbyn era, that's when I snapped out of it. And I found myself having extremely difficult conversations with, with people in the LGBTQ community that I had become so close to. Um, but I think about this often because for so many American queer young Jews who haven't had an experience like Corbynism yet, or they're just having this experience now, I wonder, I wonder, were it not for me being a British Jew during that time and being so aware of it, whether I would have come out of it the same way. And I think that it's the fact that we have these, these Jews who will conveniently dissociate from Zionism in the LGBTQ plus world and will do so with such pride and such willingness that it has allowed that world to really, really strengthen its anti-Zionist stance and, and make Israel-Palestine a queer issue, which, you know, you could, you could make it a queer issue if you wanted to. And if you did make it a queer issue, it would be the inversion of the current argument that exists, which, as we all know, is the, is the great irony and a subject of a lot of ridicule for for Zionist activists when we feel like we need a good laugh. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, that those are my more esoteric thoughts on the subject. Um, and, you know, I hope you don't mind me going down that kind of personal oh, right. pathway, but, but I really, I do empathize with Jews in that space who have chosen anti-Zionism because I think there might be something to do with our community not preparing queer Jews enough um, for this maybe fantastical moment of rejection. Maybe for some, it's a real moment of rejection. Um, I think this is why events like this are so important because we have to recognize that the Jewish community openly welcomes LGBTQ plus Jews with, you know, warm arms and, full hearts and that so that this doesn't happen I can only surmise that some of it happens because of rejection um, and I'm going to go ahead and assume that the the grand cosmic joke that that uh, we're finding is that Israel is one of the only safe places for gays and lesbians in the region and the LGBTQ community finds itself uh, supporting and making excuses for people who would kill them Literally. Yes, yes, that is the joke. Um, and and uh, Blake, to 
go a little bit further with something that uh, Eve was saying about social pressure. And I know this is something that you have really seen firsthand in university. Can you talk a little bit about the, that kind of pressure to just say, screw it, I want to be liked. I'm going to say, I hate Israel. Of course. And uh, it's at the time I didn't know um, but this is something that is so common in Jewish history. Um, one could write several books about it. Uh, throughout Jewish history in each era, there has been a progressive universalist ideology that tries to convince Jews um, and that really mandates of Jews to believe that a core tenet of their identity as Jews is incompatible with this new ideology. Um, it's old fashioned, it's regressive, it's tainted, it is standing in the way between us and our utopia. Um, and so there is, en and, and there is enormous pressure um, on Jews to accept that. Um, and as we've seen, usually among the vanguard of those trying to impose the ideology upon the Jews, um, and to convert as many Jews as possible, our fellow Jews, um, usually under the false guise or the uh, false assumption that by accepting this ideology and by championing its values, um, they are bettering the Jewish people. They are uh, reforming them in positive ways and that anti-Semitism will be eradicated once they make these specific sacrifices. Of course, that's never the case. Um, we can look at the uh, ancient Greeks um, who you know, colonized and conquered uh, the ancient land of Israel. Um, of course, as we know as the Hanukkah story, where the uh, Hellenistic Greeks pressured Jewish civilization to essentially give up everything that they had that made them Jewish, um, which entailed placing statues of uh, Greek deities in the Holy Temple. In, uh, in various religious spaces around Jerusalem, in replacing Hebrew as the official lang language with Greek. Um, Dara Horton po points out in her very uh, important article in Tablet, The Cool Kids, that some boys, uh, Jewish boys, in order to play with uh, Greek children in the gymnasium, uh, used to undergo a procedure to reverse their circumcision because they wanted to be accepted so very badly. Um, and of course, the Greeks, you know, would not have called themselves trying to decimate the Jews, like kill them en masse, just to better Jewish civilization, uh, to make it more enlightened, if you will. We see this again with the Christians um, who thought that the Jews were keeping us from, uh, excuse me, there's a truck, I'm sorry, I live in New York City. Uh, the same could be said of the Christians uh, who thought that we were holding the population of the earth back from salvation with our... Uh, very regressive and one-dimensional views um, by refusing to accept Jesus. Um, this, of course, happens again with the Soviets, um, how Jews were weaponized to bring the communist revolution to other Jews, um, often quite violently. Jews were deputized to burn down synagogues, to turn over any Jews who were caught studying Hebrew or who were engaged in Zionist activity. Um, and then, of course, this happens in our modern era um, with uh, anti-Zionism convincing large parts of the Jewish population that if they only reject Israel, if they only leave their Zionism or check their Zionism at the door, then they will be freed of animosity in left-wing spaces, that they will be granted a seat at this table of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that everything will be grand um, and the Jews will be protected if only they give up their, their birthright to the land of Israel. Um, it never works. And in fact, the Jews who are so vehement um, are not spared from anti-Semitism at all, even though, because once the ideology has succeeded, there is no longer any use for them. Um, and so it's very dark. And, 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 and I'm sorry that again, Eve said she had an esoteric answer. That was an esoteric answer uh, in and of itself. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't know any of this when I was on the college campus. Um, I didn't, uh, I, I, all I felt from my peers who were aligned with me on my side of the aisle politically um, was that it was against the 
it was against the values of the day to still believe that Israel had a right to exist. And for a minute, I believed them because how could I not? I think figured to myself, if these, if I agree with these people on A through Y, I must also agree with them on Z. And they plant these pervasive lies into the heads of, of young Jews that your community lied to you, your community betrayed you, your community brainwashed you into believing something horrible and we're here to save you from it. Sounds awful like Christianity, right? We're here to redeem you from that um, so that we can all you know, walk into a more uh, blessed future. Um, it has such ancient themes to what young people are experiencing today. And I think that there needs to be such a broader, more organized effort to combat it, to nip it in the bud before it even happens, to have a presence in these spaces to say, no, anti-Zionism is a lie. It is anti-Semitism coming from the left. It is an inverted narrative of the Jewish people's place in the world. Um, it is holding the Jewish people to double standard standards. It is organizing politics against the Jews. That needs to be constant. Um, and also there needs to be uh, broader efforts to sustain Jewish identity because, you know, Natan Sharansky once said um, that, you know, it, for the Jewish generation growing up now who is not religious and who is turning away from Israel, there is no way that their grandchildren are going to be Jewish, are going to feel Jewish, are going to continue the traditions of Judaism. Because what else do they have? Um, Israel to me is what tethers me as a more secular Jew to my identity as a Jewish person. And what we see from the pressure to denounce Israel is actually a pressure to literally break Judaism into something unrecognizable so that it won't have to be dealt with in the vague utopia that contemporary progressivism craves. Uh, wow, that was, that was quite, a, quite an impassioned speech. Um, ben, can you talk for a moment about I know that we have a lot of Canadian mainstream organizational leadership watching tonight. Can you talk a little bit about what it means to be more welcoming to LGBTQ plus Jews in Jewish spaces? Yes, of course. I mean, I also actually want to reference something that Blake said as well, because um, I think it is it's important. But with regards to what you're saying, I mean, really, first of all, it's about recognizing Jews in our spaces, right? Sorry, LGBTQ plus Jews in our spaces. It's really about making sure that they're welcome. It's about having conversations. And it is complicated because we're dealing with, you know, halakha and we're dealing with um, tradition. And there are people who feel very attached to that, people who live their lives by it. So we have to really get to a core, which is empathy. We have to empathize with, with one another. We have to understand one another. We have to see each other first and foremost as Jews, even if we express our Jewishness differently, even if we don't practice the same forms of Judaism, we have to see each other first and foremost as Jews, because we are all members of Am Yisrael, right, the people of Israel, and I think that is why this concept of peoplehood is so significant, because religiosity is declining, and also just matter of fact the jews are not just a religious community it's just a fact right so we have to represent another facet of our ancient identity which is peoplehood and to understand that we have to go back to history and we have to understand okay what was the concept of jewish people like two thousand years ago two and a half thousand years ago three thousand years ago and i think we'll find there's actually it presents us with with challenging ideas to the notion of who is accepted today so it's really about openness it's about conversation but also there has to be it's a two-way street you know i'm not going to go into an orthodox synagogue and expect to be able to get married right now that may happen at some point but it's not happening right now and maybe it should happen but maybe it's also okay that it doesn't you know we have to also understand the parameters of what we're dealing with because we are operating in a rule driven system and i think i see this a lot you know i see people saying you know things like as a jew is a jew is a jew is a jew and they're absolutely right but at the same time we are a rule driven society and we cannot discard those rules because whether it's jewish peoplehood jewish religion the thing that tethers us is our the common the common threads and I want to bring something up, which both Eve and Blake spoke about, and it's internalized anti-Jewishness. I know we're going to get to that later, but it felt like the most appropriate time to talk about it. Okay. What they're describing is internalized anti-Semitism, anti-Jewishness, which is traditionally called Jewish self-hate. 
And that is the subject of my second book, which is coming out in October. And there is this idea that we, that only Jews who are anti-Zionist or only Jews who kind of go to the extremes are suffering from internalized anti-Jewishness. And that's not quite true. Of course, from my perspective, anti-Zionist Jews are suffering from internalized anti-Jewishness, but it also is able to infect even the proudest of Jews. So in my upcoming book, I've interviewed five people. One of them is an Orthodox Jewish woman whose, life, whose, whose father was a rabbi. She, she went to seminary. Her life was completely defined by her Jewishness. She developed a very strong Jewish anchor, which grounded in her, in her Jewishness. But she was still able, I guess, to develop this internalized anti-Jewishness. So this is a, a conversation we have to be having across the board. And it speaks to what Eve was saying about we have to also be inclusive, we have to be representative, we have to create space for Jewish people because the pressures of the non-Jewish world are so great. It isn't just disavowing Zionism. I want to ask anyone in this call, you know, the 200 people, have any of you ever said, I'm Jewish but, I'm Zionist but? You know, they're subtle, but they're subtle expressions of internalized anti-Jewishness. And it's absolutely vital that we recognize it. And again, like we said earlier, this is not our fault. And we have to root these conversations in empathy. And Eve said this, we have to have empathy for Jews who are anti-Zionist, because from our perspective, they have absorbed non-Jewish perspectives on Jewish identity, and they then use that to define their own identity or their own place in the world. So actually, that's a tragedy. All internalized anti-Jewishness is a tragedy. And, you know, we're talking about Jewish pride. We're talking about how we move forward. We move forward by recognizing this is a problem in our community. I often see articles which say things like this is a rare problem or it doesn't exist. The people who write those articles are factually incorrect. We can trace it from the Greek the Jewish men that, that Blake mentioned, the men who uh, engaged in epispasm, the reversal of circumcision, we can trace it from then all the way through history. And we have to have a bird's eye perspective on our history because that's how we spot these patterns. So, you know, I think all, all, th there, it's both of these questions or both these statements are really talking about the same thing. Creating a Jewish world which is rooted in pride, which is rooted in empathy, which is rooted in diversity, in celebration, in Jewish joy. And when we exclude Jews for their LGBTQ plus identity, we are taking away some of their Jewish joy. But I want to also say that we're not blaming the Jewish community for internalized anti-Jewishness. The fault of internalized anti-Jewishness lies with a racist non-Jewish world who is forcing us to conform to their perspectives of the good Jew, which is by the way, a categorization which they and they alone create. Um, thank you. I, and I want to follow that thought and get back to uh, the introduction where I talked about uh, you know, people close to me thinking that the, the name of Jew hate was too strong a name. And as I watched those videos um, and it, you hear um, the uh, Palestinian protest broke up into attacks on Jews. And I feel almost uh, a, a kind of shame myself at including that uh, to, to, to say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that, that I included that. I, there's lots more other issues of anti-Semitism. And it's really incredible that I, as a Jew, feel ashamed to mention that pro-Palestinians like to beat us up or kill us. And, awesome. that, and I think it gets back to what you were saying earlier about the ubiquity of this anti-Semitism that is baked into Western civilization, as you've, you've often written. And I, I feel like this, this internalized anti-Semitism that you're writing about is one more manifestation of that issue. Absolutely, because the non-Jewish world tells Jews that we're not allowed to advocate for ourselves. We're not allowed to talk about our experiences because we have to be quiet. And that was almost the kind of official party line when Eve and I were growing up. It was, keep your head down, don't say anything. Now, as anyone who follows me online, I was never able to keep my head down, much to my kind of my family's dismay. It was, I'm basically too obnoxious. But I just couldn't. I was just like, no, if I, there, was, there used to be a show in the UK called Catchphrase. Eve will remember this. And it was, the tagline of the host was, say what you see. We have to say what we see. 
we're going to identify Jew hate wherever and whenever it occurs. We're not going to be silent. We're not going to pretend, oh, this is an inconvenient time to talk about this. We're not going to, or this is from a group which is also marginalized. Just as we, as we're discussing, have our own issues with LGBTQ plus phobia, other minority communities have their own issues as well. And some of those issues are with us. Being a minority does not, um, preclude you from being anti-Jewish. It doesn't preclude you from being racist towards Jewish people. And we're not going to keep our heads down. I think that is something we have all learned from being LGBTQ+, because we're encouraged in the LGBTQ plus world to advocate for ourselves. And the response of when we do versus the response that when we advocate for our Jewish selves could not be more different, but we're not going to listen. We're not going to care. We're going to say it like it is. And you know, we have to be nuanced. So we're not painting, you know, the entirety of the Palestinian population as inherently anti-Jewish, but we are going to recognize that one of the major facets of kind of pro-Palestinianism, particularly in the West, is rooted in Jew hate. And how do we know that? Well, we see the physical and the, the online attacks on Jews. As you said, Eve has experienced some of the worst really the worst I think in history directed at an individual, but also let's think about the rhetoric that those people themselves say. Are they advocating for Palestine? Are they talking about, okay, let's think about infrastructure, let's talk about women's rights, let's talk about LGBTQ plus rights. The answer is no, they're not talking about establishing a Palestinian state. All they're doing is using the Palestinians, which is very tragic, as a stick to beat the Jews with. And while it may be inconvenient to some people that we're going to address that, and it may challenge their liberal sensibilities, quite frankly, I, and I think even Blake also, we don't care. We're going to say it like we see it. Yeah, and I know that people don't rebut Eve online by saying, well, this is how we plan a secular Palestinian state that will be safe for Jews. They say, we're going to put you in the oven. Ha, ha, ha. They don't um, even say that, actually. <laughs> they just say my hate name because they're juvenile. Uh, which is? You fart low. Yeah. Um, brilliant, our enemies. Um, on a little bit of a happier note, Eve, uh, and, and carrying on with what Ben is saying, that Judaism as a traditional culture and a traditional people hasn't always been welcome to LGBTQ plus individuals and has a reputation for that and i want to ask all three of you how it feels right now to be recognized as a leader of the jewish people i actually want to begin this by by following on from what ben was just saying because i think something that is alluded to in that is how much of an anomaly we are as people in activist spaces that we are saying things as we see it because in the current um tribal wars diatribe that we all exist in online and offline you know we live in this hierarchy of oppression and we are we are dictated at as to how we're supposed to think and how we're supposed to theorize and actually intellectualism and individual thought is discouraged so we are, the, the reason why it's so easy to hate us is because we're doing what so many people in social justice spaces have been actively discouraged from doing, which is having our own ideas about what we think is right and wrong, um, making exceptions of our own minds, as it were, which is why we're constantly told that we're centering ourselves in the conversation, which is not what we're doing at all. We're just speaking the truth and seeing things and um, saying things as we see it and to that to answer your question I think it is incredibly gratifying to be recognized for our courage in doing that because we have come from these from these traditionally activist advocate orientated spaces because kind of by nature of being part of an LGBTQ plus community you are engaged in social and political activism because it because it precludes your ability to live life in an equal way in our society that you have your own your own intimately personal connection to those to to those um those kind of advocacy verticals and so to be able to take 
that from a community in which we were shut out because of this other facet of our lives and this other multitude in our in our identities to be able to take that element and use it not only to bolster our own people but to show up the hypocrisy of the people who feigned to care about us and really only wanted to use us as the good Jews. Um, it's, it's very gratifying, but I will say that, you know, it comes at an enormous price. And sometimes I, I do feel like there is an element of tokenizing among certain voices online. And there is a there is a misunderstanding, there is a disconnect between the encouragement to keep speaking and the looking away when, when we take physical, personal and emotional hits because of what we're doing. Um, and, and I really do, you know, I've, I've been talking about this a lot recently because because this work is ongoing and and we've all been at the forefront of this for a tremendously long time and it does start to have its impact on you a lot of it is positive and equal amounts of it is negative and i really am trying to urge the jewish community at the moment to stop relying on so much of the the old system and to really try and and meaningfully support the advocates who are doing this work because it's not easy being blacklisted for being loud Jews and trying to build futures and lives um, and also feeling fundamentally like you can't walk away from this fight because you understand the impact you're having and the power of your own voice. Um, I, I want to get the other uh, gentleman's opinion on this question as well, but I just want to follow this a little bit further with you, Eve, and we talked a lot about the abuse that you receive online. And I've just got a message here saying, absolute world Jewish leaders. I don't have a question, just so happy to see my heroes in this fascinating talk. You are also important, so inspiring. And I know Eve, uh, you, you get a lot of great reception from Jews around the world. Can you talk a little bit about what that means to you and to, and, and the kind of the, the kind of response that you've gotten from Jews for speaking out on their behalf? I mean, it's it's hard to, honestly, I don't mean to sound cheesy, but it's hard to put it into words sometimes because you get the most emotionally resonating, heartfelt, unique, unreal messages from people in places I didn't even know Jews existed in, to be honest with you. Um, and places that I, I am well aware Jews existed and, and had no idea they were suffering the same kinds of fears as I do. And those messages always mean so much. And they, they can always come at a point at which I really feel depleted of energy. So, you know, it's, it's never... The people who take the time to send those messages, it's never lost on me. And I actually, to anyone who's doing work like this would recommend, I have now a photo album on my iPhone that I save of a lot of those messages that I call fight fuel, because sometimes I need to remember some of these individuals in the dark who really, it's not just that they don't have the courage to speak themselves, they don't have the verbiage. And it's something that Ben and I have spoken about a lot, especially when we started to do our webinars and our, the series of webinars that we did for, for an audience that we created. Um, it's that, you know, there is, there is a, a, a real truth in the idea that a lot of us have been failed by older generations when it comes to the education element of our Jewish identity. And that ties directly to the notion of keeping our heads down that was really the culture that we were fed when we were growing up. So if you were keeping your head down, why would you need to know how to advocate for yourself? Why would you need all of the facts at your fingertips? You, you wouldn't unless you had your own intellectual interest in it. And beyond that, it's also not fair to expect people to do 
as much studying as is required to sometimes have these extremely robust intellectual standoffs with people in a 240 character space on Twitter. Um, it's not it's not fair to have to do that much studying and that much deep diving in order to be able to undo all of the lies and the misconceptions and the propaganda that is spread about us. Um, but, you know, to be able to provide any verbiage for people who who are contemplating having that difficult conversation with a colleague or a friend or a family member or anyone, it, it really is hard to put into words how meaningful the, the impact of my work has been to, to someone who just, who is about to make that, that leap of faith and stand up for themselves as a Jew who has never who has never done that for themselves before in their lives. It's, it's really, it's hard to quantify how much that means. Um, Blake, for you, can you talk about how it feels, especially as such a young man, to be perceived as a leader in the Jewish community? Um, I, if you would have told me uh, in October of 2019, which was a month before my New York Times article came out, that I would be pursuing a career in work within the Jewish community and that I would be receiving the same messages that Eve receives from people all across the country and the world, thanking me for my work and getting to sit on panels and write for magazines and articles and speak at rallies, I would have... Um, literally called you insane um, because this was nothing this was could not have been less on my radar um, it was my experience at university uh, you know Ezra Klein recently wrote in his book why we're polarized that oftentimes if not the majority of times um, identity is that uh, lay dormant are called to to be are, are, are awoken when they feel threatened, when they feel targeted. And that's exactly what happened. Judaism, Zionism were all things that I took for granted. They were all things that were non-contentious. They were all things that could not be more separate from what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and it just so happened that now it's all I think about. It's all I want to do. I can't imagine a reality where I'm not doing this and not pursuing this um, because it just means so much to me. Um, and because I understand very uh, intensely the implications of all the ideas and uh, arguments we're speaking of tonight. Um, and, you know, in regards to being LGBT and, and my place in the Jewish world, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, I've always said I've felt more comfortable being openly gay in the Jewish world than I have being openly Jewish in the, in the gay world. Um, for reasons that we've already discussed. Um, so it, 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 it's almost normal to me um, because there's been so much more to be, to look at with a positive view and smile about than there is to be angry at. There's so much more positivity coming my way than negativity. That might be because I choose not to look at the negativity, but if we're being realistic, what's the difference? Um, that's great. And Ben? Can you try and put into words what it's felt like and been like for you in this ride of the last few years and, and being in this leadership role? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I'm, I'm kind of an outlier because I'm not from North America, which let's be honest, is the center of these conversations, is the center of these conversations. And neither is Eve, of course. Um, but I also live in Hong Kong. So I feel, I honestly feel, you know, my book is Jewish Pride. So it's kind of like, Punny, but yeah, I feel very proud that I'm just this Jew from this tiny Jewish community who does not live in a place with many Jewish people. And really because of the internet, I have developed a voice and a platform. And in all honesty, I see this work as my destiny. And I know that sounds a little cheesy, but I really do. I used to work in fashion. I used to work in fashion marketing and I used to work at Tom Ford in London. And that was a very brief kind of interlude in my Jewish life because as Eve was the chairman of the Federation of Zionist Youth, I also was the chairman of a, a forum, a youth forum that Eve was on, actually. We did those events together, Eve, I think. So I've always been involved, but yeah, I, 
I, I stepped away and worked in fashion and this work called back to me and I responded to a call. I mean, I'm an educator and that's another way I feel my, I'm kind of an outlier. I'm not a journalist, I'm not, I actually don't consider myself to be an activist. After this, I'm going to go and I'm going to go to school and I'm going to stand in front of my students and teach a class. And that's kind of the world that I live in. So I do feel very proud that this person from a very unlikely background has become, you know, a leader. And I think that we are trained in, in our societies, particularly in Britain, to be self-deprecating and to say, oh, no, no, I'm not a leader. But actually, yeah, we are leaders and I'm very proud of it. And I'm very proud to have written this book that has kickstarted the movement. And again, from an LGBTQ perspective, I think it's really incredible. And I think that it has been a major turning point in how many aspects or many parts of our community see LGBTQ plus Jews. And, you know, I get those messages as um, Eve and Blake do. And actually, Eve told me she was like, screenshot them. Because it can get rough when thousands of people online are saying the most horrendous things about you. It can get, it's quite traumatic. And not many people understand. So that's why I feel so lucky to have Eve, because our friendship kind of is set apart from this work, but we're both experiencing versions of the same thing. So the fact that we have each other to kind of rely on and discuss has been really amazing. But yeah, I mean, it's it's my destiny. It's amazing. But yeah, it's also enormously hard and enormously exhausting. You know, Sunday morning, my time was the hostage situation. So I, and I saw Eve's tweet or Instagram like within minutes of waking up and then I had to respond. So yeah, all of Sunday morning I was working. And I think that's something people don't necessarily realize is the social media work is work for us. You know, it's our passion, we're, we're doing it because we have to do it, but we're also, we understand that we're making a difference. We understand the responsibility that we have. So yeah, it's, it's many things. It's wonderful, it's hard, it's frustrating, it's exhausting, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I received a message the other day that said, that my book Jewish Pride Rebuilding a People had given a 60 year old man permission for the first time in his life to start kind of investigating his Jewish identity and then his daughter said this is the first time that her and her father had ever really bonded over anything and I mean that is such a privilege like this is this work is the honor of my life like I feel so privileged to be able to speak on panels, to write books and to, to write things and to say things which inspire and empower people. I mean, and it's for me as much as it is everyone else. You know, I need these words. I need Jewish pride. So in writing this book and creating this manifesto, it was for me as much as everyone else. And I just love being Jewish so much. And I think it's such an incredible, I'm so proud that I get to spend my life doing this work, really. And Ben, I, I remember very well the first time that we spoke yeah, our, our me too. Corbin. And it's, I don't know if it was about four years ago. Yeah. And I went right to my wife afterwards and I said, I have met the most incredible person and he is going to be such a great leader for us. He's so articulate, knows his stuff. And, uh, you know, as Thank in you. those cases, I was right. Um, <laughs> but let's use uh, your book now to segue uh, into something that I think a lot of people are watching tonight about, and that's the fight against anti-Semitism. And your book has a little bit of a different thesis on it, which yeah. is that we need to stop being obsessed with anti-Semitism and start being obsessed with ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just really recognizing the terrain. Even I always say this to each other, we have to understand the terrain. And we have to recognize fundamentally that Jew hate is not our fault and it's not really our problem. Of course, I understand that it's a problem which impacts us, but because it's not our problem, we're actually not the ones who can solve it in any meaningful way. I think that people like Eve Blake and myself and the many others particularly the Canadian advocates like Isabella Hazan, Shai Deluca, what we're doing is fighting to keep it at bay. Because that's, I believe, all Jews can do. The real work to dismantle the system of oppression that is Jew hatred lies with the non-Jewish world. So what is our work? Our work is Jewish pride. And that's not to say that we're not involved in this fight. Jewish pride tells us that we can and that we should advocate for ourselves. It gives us enough self-esteem to understand when we're being treated poorly or when we're not being treated the way in which we deserve. So that is something that that, that is our involvement in the fight against your hatred. But we have to educate, inspire and empower one another. We have to create a movement which is multi-generational and sustainable, which 
allows Jews to see their Jewishness as a source of pride and never shame. And I think that if many of us look deep inside ourselves, we would see there are instances where we've been embarrassed or ashamed of being Jewish. And I want to say that that's fundamentally not our fault. We have experienced this, you know, well-documented manifestation of racism, which is internalized racism, internalized Jew hate. And we are dealing with a world which is almost inherently oppositional to us. It is very hard for Jews to integrate into the non-Jewish world. It's not impossible, but it certainly is hard. And again, we have to understand the rules of engagement and the terrain. So what do we do? Well, we have to, we have to celebrate Jewish joy. We have to celebrate Jewish life. We have to encourage Jewish action. I started wearing a kippah, which I'm currently wearing, but you can't see because my hair is so high. And I wear it every single day. And it's a reminder that I am a Jew, even though I live in Hong Kong, even though I'm about to go to a, a secular school and teach a class on dystopian worlds, I am a Jew and I'm representing the Jewish people when I go out. I light my Hanukkah, I read all of the books that are on my shelves. I engage with Jewish life. That is Jewish pride. We are so much more than the hate that we experience. We're so much more than the Shoah, the pogroms, the social media pogrom, the kind of the, the term that Eve coined in her groundbreaking tablet article in May. We are so much more than that. We are an ancient civilization that has survived against all odds. And there is this idea that, you know, it's kind of a joke and we say, they tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat. Now, as we know, with Puri emits, they tried to kill us, we survived, let's drink. But we have to add a little, uh, a little a little extra thing in there and it's they tried to kill us we survived because we made it so let's eat and or drink we did not roll over we have always stood up and fought whether it was the maccabees the barkovka revolters the warsaw ghetto uprisers and the countless jews from the soviet union we have always stood up and defended and protected our jewishness and our judaism and that is what jewish pride is because it's so wonderful it's so incredible and i genuinely feel so lucky to be jewish and jewishness for me is a source of joy and not shame or pain that's that's beautiful thank you um eve let's talk about uh activism how have mm -hmm. you been effective and what do you consider your greatest or proudest achievements as an activist Hmm. Um, I think that my, you know, Ben spoke earlier about the concept of destiny. And I know that that might sound a bit highfalutin, but I have been writing forever. And my flair for writing has been apparent to me since I was about 15 years old. And I knew that I wanted to use words in this way that could create impact. I believe in words being a source of great um, comfort, but also of great provocation and of great drama. And I like to be dramatic with language. I like to be the trailblazer who will define a, a term or coin a term like the social media pogrom and make people go crazy, you know, because that's what that piece did. It drove people nuts and it created a something so insane whereby my hate name was trending at number two nationwide in all of America because of the reaction to a very, you know, a very, a very simple metaphor that was created, but that is the power of language. And that's why I was obsessed with language when, when I discovered that I, I have this kind of like I say, a, a creative flair, an individuality in the way that I used language. And for years, I used language and writing to talk about popular culture and to, to interview hugely famous people and, and profile them and put you in the room and, and really describe, you know, I was a really descri descriptive writer. I mean, I still am, but a lot of the, the advocacy work requires very specific details and an extremely careful language in order to to almost withstand the, the next chess move that you're going to get from the opposite side. You know, you want to prepare yourself for any, any holes in what you've written so that nobody can, can undermine what, what you've just said. And when you have such limited space as we do, because we're online so much of the time and, you know, we're not always in a 90 minute panel in which we can really expand on our ideas. You have to be so specific with language, but I have always been really excited by that challenge and 
and love the opportunity to rise to that occasion. And I love nothing more than something happening and me having to, me being commissioned to respond to that within 30 minutes and just being in the, in the, you know, the heat and the sweat and the madness of that moment when you're, when you're having to use all of your words in such a efficient and pointed way to, to lead with an impassioned, impassioned and accurate message. So for me, you know, that's, that's been my major tool of my advocacy and that's been destined for me from, from years. And it's been, as painful as it has been having having a community i was so i was i was so in love with and and so loved by and i'm not talking about the lgbtq community i'm talking about the music and and film and pop culture community shut its doors on me because i'm an inconveniently loud jew it gives me it gives me kind of like oddly uh, gratifying sense of glee that it is the it is the skills in which you know I spent all of those years cutting my teeth to acquire doing that job that I that I am now able to to be such a strong leader for our people it I don't know the the, the fact that one thing came that thing came out of the other is there's something really beautiful about that and and um yeah I mean it's really, for me, it's about language and it's about the, the power of that, the power of my voice and, and my words. And I'm, I'm proud. Nothing gives me more pride than when I hear that somebody has been quoting something that I've said or the way in which I've used my language, because this is a war of words. And a lot of the reason why Jewish people are scared to stick up for themselves and to fight back is because they don't know what to say because they haven't been taught. And because everyone else in the non-Jewish world who has all of their theories and their conspiracies and their propaganda have been well-oiled in what to say. And sometimes when you don't have something as simple as a sentence to clap back with, that can just feel like a wall that is right in front of you that you can't get over. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> That's an excellent answer, and uh, I'll just add that Eve is a truly elite writer. I love your writing, and the article that is being referenced uh, is in Tablet Magazine, I believe it was two years ago, Wake Up and Smell the Anti-Semitism. Everyone should look it up, and uh, here we are two years later, and I, I'm going to assume from reading you on Twitter, you're still shouting the same mantra wake up yeah i mean you know i've i've found a lot of alternative ways to say, <laughs> to say that but, um, yeah i mean you know the 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 wonderful thing if there is such a thing about the the um the regularity of anti-semitic attacks that we see is that there is plenty of opportunity to be verbose about this and to find new ways of saying the same thing so that you know if you didn't quite get through to someone via one metaphor or or one uh, highly highly strong tweet then maybe maybe this other kind of mixture of words might get through to them but um yeah there were two there were two articles that are being referenced one is the wake up article that was from september 2020 and the other is the social media pogrom that was written in may of last year which was in direct response to the way in which the media shut the the jewish voice out during the the war against hamas um and speaking of that uh blake can you talk a little bit about what we learned as a community uh, through the war in May and through what happened last weekend in Texas? And how can we use what we've learned to help explain our position and to help defend our point of view? Of course. Um... So what we learned from May of 2021 was that anti-Zionism is in fact anti-Semitism. Um, regardless of how civil 
and reasonable and progressive it sounds on paper when it manifests itself into a radical political movement when those who believe very strongly in its ideas begin to act it presents itself as violence against jews in american cities as violence against jews in european cities as discrimination against jews from spaces where they were once welcomed and celebrated. It is demonizing of Jews and Jewish scholarship and Jewish literature. It is the marginalization of Jews from public life, period, end of story. That's what anti-Zionism was designed to do in the Soviet Union. It was designed to implement anti-Semitic policies, anti-Jewish policies, and fooling the rest of the world into thinking, no, 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 we just have a problem with Israel. Um, it is a facade, it is a lie. Um, if we wanna talk about actual anti-Zionism and not the political one that was born in the Soviet Union to which I'm referring to, we can talk about actual anti-Zionism in the Arab world, which if you ask, uh, uh, you know, I've spoken to and I've heard speak uh, many uh, Arab Muslims, um, who were once uh, anti-Zionist because they grew up in a very anti-Zionist household, and they'll tell you to their face, of course that was anti-Semitic. It, it, it is the idea that says that minorities do not have a right to sovereignty in the Middle East. There must be political and ethnic hegemony throughout the entire Arab Muslim world, and that the Jews have no right to be here. They must be pushed into the sea. They must be expelled, and there must be an Arab majority state uh, to replace Israel. All the Soviet Union did was flip this war uh, against Israel after they figured out it couldn't be won with tanks and bombs. They flipped it from sounding like a right-wing cause to a left-wing cause making the Jews the antagonizers, making the, it's a complete inversion of politics. Um, it accuses the Jews of not permitting the Arabs a state when in fact the Arabs refused to permit the Jews a state. Um, that is what we saw in May. We saw the lie. We saw the, this political movement that has so much ancient uh, argument and tropes baked into it that anybody who's looking close enough is, either completely naive or is willfully ignorant to not see the threat that this poses. Um, it also showed Jews that, guess what? Hatred can come from your political home. Hatred uh, can come at you from your own backyard. Anti-Semitism is not only anti-Semitism when it carries a tiki torch and it says all Jews must die. And you're going to have to reckon with this. You have no choice. Um, and it also, I think, alerted American Jews to the situation of Jews in Europe, which we have been ignoring for quite a long time because we always separated ourselves from Europe and thought that the trends that were happening there with anti-Semitism on both sides of the pol political spectrum could never happen here. Although we did have an easier time accepting right-wing anti-Semitism because it's one we were familiar with identifying and it's one we were familiar with condemning. Um, and it also didn't compromise our own it, it, it made us even more valuable on the left because all of a sudden we were victimized and you know, we love victimization in the 21st century. Um, and so I think it was a wake up call. It was an alarm bell to all of these things um, and more uh, that we in fact are living within the confines of Jewish history. We are not separated from Jewish history. We are, the story is still happening and being a proud Jew is something active, not passive. Um, and we have to continue this fight because Lador Vador Imahaleinu, right? And every generation. Um, and so, yeah, it's uh, May, I think May of 2021 changed a lot of minds and a lot of hearts for the, I hope it'll lead to some positive change. Oh, you're muted, David. I'm gonna turn to some questions from the audience that we've been getting in a moment, but there is one, Last question that I wanted to ask for a, a quick explanation from Ben. We are all fans of David Hirsch, and he has coined one term, which I think is so important that people need to understand. And I'm sure I don't even need to say what it is. Ben, you can tell us about it. Like there, there's really two, right? I, you were talking about the community of the good. 
Oh, I was actually talking the other one, the Livingston oh, that, formulation. Okay, so the Livingston formulation. The Livingston formulation, yeah. that's just how brilliant he is because he has, he's really kind of the center of understanding of leftist Juhi. And that is where Europe and Britain is further on than America because we understand, we have the language to talk about it thanks to people like David Hirsch. So the Livingston formulation was named after Ken Livingston who's the former mayor of London, who is a racist. He hates Jewish people and his hatred of uh, the Jews is expressed through a hatred of Israel. He has kind of misrepresented the Havara agreement from, I think, 1933 between Zionists and the Nazis, and he has said many dreadful things. And when accused of Jew hate, he did something quite curious. He inverted the accusation. He said, no, and you are accusing me of this. He was speaking to the figurative accuser. You have accused me of this in order to purposely distract or diminish Israel's crimes against the Palestinians. So this is a conspiracy. What he's accusing the accuser do, of doing is conspiring and acting in bad faith because he's not saying, no, I'm not anti-Jewish, you've made a mistake. He's saying you have purposefully, you have purposely inverted this accusation. So you're the person acting in bad faith. You're the racist, not me. And this is something we see a lot and it's very common. And David Hirsch named that um, before he wrote his fantastic book, which is somewhere here, Contemporary Left Anti-Semitism. And it's a book that everyone should pick up. And yeah, it's really, really important because that's what happens. We are accused. And that is the nature of Jew hate. Jew hate has always, has always positioned Jews as the oppressor. We've always been the, um, the community that is killing children to drink their blood, of conspiring, of only caring about economic resources, of being the physical embodiment of Satan. We've always been accused of those things. And what is vital, and Eve kind of spoke to this point, is that we're educated, we understand our experience. And that's why the Bogart, that's why the Cloud of Jew Hate, which is uh, an explanation for my students again that I created that's in my book, Jewish Pride of Building Your People, and David Hirsch's um, Community of the Good and Livingston Formulation are so important because they help us understand the world we're living in. And now that you have had that explained, and you may not have heard, never heard of this phrase before, I assure you, you will see it everywhere. You will see this constantly happening. And we even saw it this weekend. It's this accusation that we're acting in bad faith in order to say, in the case of Texas, to demonize Muslim people. Actually, no, we're talking about Jew hatred and the fact that a British Muslim person took Jews hostage in a Texas synagogue. That's what we're talking about. And that is why Jewish pride is so fundamentally important. It gives us permission to reject these terms, these ideas. It gives us permission to name them. And yeah, I mean, you will start to see, I promise, the Livingston formulation everywhere in different iterations. And that's the thing we have to remember about Jew hate. It's a many headed beast. So we explain it through one specific thing. So the blood libel, we understand historically, that was the accusation that Jews murdered non-Jewish children around Pesach, usually to drink their blood. That is how it was expressed, but we have to go to the core. What was it really saying? And like blood libel, the Livingston formulation has kind of more iterations that we have to be on the lookout for. Thank you. And um, I'm going to start now with uh, a few of the questions that we've been getting that uh, um, have been passed on. First of all, we have one from Pat, and I'll put this to Blake. How do you personally carry on in the face of this tsunami of hatred? Um, <laughs> I, I find a lot of comfort in Jewish culture. Um, and I also find a lot of comfort in the Jews who came before me and before Eve and before Ben, um, who had to face um, much worse odds and much worse hatred and yet used that adversity um, as a means and as a solution to make life better for the Jewish people. Um, whether it be Theodor Herzl, whether it be Natan Sharansky, whether it be the men and women who stood up um, as partisans in resistance fighting in, in the Shoah, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or the people who you know, moved to pre-state Israel and almost died of malaria, um, draining swamps and working the land because of their intense commitment to providing safe haven for the Jews. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm not affected by it. Um, 
in because of that perspective that I have. People always, you know, ask me like, are you okay? Like even, you know, when horrible things uh, have been uh, said against me or even because people know that I'm so invested in Jewish issues when anti-Semitism happens. You know, people will text me like, are you okay? Can we support you? Can we do anything? And it's true, times, you know, are hard, particularly this past weekend during the hostage crisis, I was not okay. But I am strengthened and feel, um, and feel more confident when I remember where we've been um, and how even in the darkest of times, we can still turn to our own peoplehood and our own culture. And I live in New York's Lower East Side. I can walk out of my front door and see Jewish life all around me. Um, and, and not only Jewish life, but Jewish history all around me in the names of streets and delis. Uh, you can see the Katz's uh, sign from my window right here. Um, and I just, I'm bombarded with that life and it just makes it all worthwhile because I could focus on that and the benefits of what I do rather than, I don't know, a ratio or <laughs> someone being horrible. Thank you, that's a great answer. Um, Eve, uh, this question is from uh, Arthur Walensky. How do you engage with the concept of pinkwashing and that Israel only pretends to be friendly to Jews to trick people in the world? How do I engage? I acquire the facts that will nuke, will, will nuke that argument in pretty much an instant. The facts are that Israel is the most LGBTQ plus friendly society in the Middle East. And this whole concept of pink washing is propagandist. It's a complete lie. Um, it's designed to intimidate. It's designed to make you question yourself and wonder whether or not there is any truth to it. Um, it's a convenient, again, it's just another example of how pro-Palestinianism has latched itself onto the social justice movements of the day in order to proliferate its message. And it's hella convincing when you have uh, so many Instagram influencers and famous celebrities touting the same the same rubbish that that these theories purport to be true, but pink washing is a load of nonsense. And you know, Israel is working towards having better equality for queer people. Um, and it is not, you know, we, we can talk about we can we can talk about the ways in which Israel perhaps isn't as as uh, progressive as say. America or certain American states or the UK when it comes to gay marriage at the moment. But these are also, I think something that we don't forget is that these, these elements of progress are also relatively new in the places in which they have been legalized. And it's not like these conversations are not on the table in Israel. Um, I'm happy to have conversations about those elements, but in terms of the grand overhaul of uh, and, and this and this lie the lie again that israel is the most evil country in the world capable of the most evil things ergo it is only using queer people to to um propel a false message about how great it is a place for for uh, for gay people then go to pride in tel aviv and you'll see it's the, the biggest pride festival in the world year on year. Um, it, does not, it does not reflect reality. And it's not always about having the facts. It's about having an audience willing to hear them. And I say this a lot. You will come up against people who will promote this propaganda. And you really have to ask yourself a lot of the time whether or not it's worth engaging with them. Because a lot of the time they are just stoking a fire because they want to fight and they and they actually want to engage in anti-Semitism because what you realize is the more that you are uh, on the other side of anti-Semitism, the more you understand the lust that people who hate Jews have for picking on the Jew and tripping the Jew up and making the Jew feel small and bad. And it's this 
pleasure actually that they get out of their anti-Semitic rhetoric. So you really have to pick and choose your battles because you could dispel energy all day trying to fight bigots who promote these ideas and it's not it's not worth your time. It's it's better to speak to our own community and empower within and teach other Jews why pink washing is a lie as opposed to going into endless back and forths with people who will just continue to come back at you with another lie that they've been fed on some pamphlet from a you know an LGBTQ plus march that decided to ban stars of David because apparently anti-Zionism is an anti-Semitism you know thank you um, this is going to be our, our last question, and uh, I'm so sorry to uh, members of the audience who, uh, who haven't had their questions asked. I can assure you I also have many questions that I still want to ask too, but uh, this is a great question from uh, Ottawa's David Reitenberg, a great man who I know at this very shul, and Ben, how can the Canadian Jews reproduce the amazing response and unanimous outrage that we saw in Britain against the anti-Semitic slash anti-Zionist Corbyn movement? I think it's an excellent question. And I also want to praise the Canadian Jewish community because I'm doing quite a lot of work with the Friends of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And I've been amazed at their response and how quickly Canadian Jewry have recognized the threat far, far quicker than their cousins kind of south of the border. Um, I think that the Canadian Jewish community, it's about not stopping, it's about keeping at it. When we were talking about Corbyn, they told us to be quiet. They called it a row, which I'm not sure makes sense in my accent, but it means like a quarrel. They said like, oh, the Jews are fighting with Labour. No, we were not fighting. The Labour Party, Her Majesty's most loyal opposition, was targeting an ethno-religious minority, actively targeting, and we didn't stop talking about it. We came together as one. The literal WhatsApp groups that I was a part of three, four years ago, I'm still a part of today. We came together, we had debates, we had dialogue, we didn't need to agree on every single thing. So we're not a monolith. And we have to understand that. And there should be a variety of perspectives. That's actually a very Jewish idea. But we came together, we spoke with one voice, and we didn't stop speaking about it. And we were not allowing the non-Jewish world in which we lived to gaslight us, to make us feel as if we were speaking out of turn, or as if we were centering ourselves too much. We we had a blight, we had like a, a laser focus. It was absolutely obsessive for years, and it was incredibly effective. And I think that every Jewish community in the world should be looking at the British Jewish community. And not only just because of how we fought, because of how we fought with pride. We were a beacon of Jewish pride. We knew that we should be treated better. We knew that what we were experiencing was wrong. And we loved ourselves. We loved each other, Amechad, one people. And that was one of the most significant ideas that was present in that fight. So that is what I would say for the Canadian and any other Jewish community. But I will say the Canadian Jewish community has been formidable and actually has responded far quicker than many others so it, it take take a take heart in that that's really important thank you uh that's a wonderful answer and a wonderful way to uh begin to close our program uh we have had many comments tonight asking how can i support these great leaders and i can tell you all exactly how to support them the donation page on the registration page is still open it's going to be open for another day so please, after this program, go to that registration page and pony up for these guys who are bearing an incredible brunt and incredible burden for our community. And uh, we appreciate that uh, very much. I want to uh, thank our panelists so much. Ben, even Blake, you guys are, as advertised, incredible. I want to thank uh, Deputy Minister Idan Rol and the embassy in Ottawa for bringing him to us. It was a treat to have him. I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Congregation Beshalom of Ottawa Legacy Fund and Jewish Federation of Ottawa Microgrants, who funded this to allow it to exist. And as an independently produced panel, we could not have gotten anyone to watch tonight without the support of organizations like this shul, Kehlet Beth Israel, Temple Israel, Sija, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center, United Grassroots Movement, Stand With Us Canada, 
Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada, the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation, Hasbara Fellowships Canada, Honest Reporting Canada, and the UJA Federation of Greater Toronto. I'd also like to very much thank personally for the help and support uh, Sheba Birhanu and Susan Marcus of Sija, January Cohen, uh, Jenny Roberge, and Alexandra Matt. Thank you all. Um, and I'll just close by saying, and, and I'd like to invite the panelists, if you are able to stick around for a couple of minutes while the credits roll, um, we can have a l'chaim. And uh, Rabbi, I know the rule about sherry casks. Don't worry, it's kosher scotch. Um, and I just want to close by saying thank you to all our viewers because this is a community battle now and we need the knowledge that we get from panels like this to fight racism. We all need to be educated uh, enough to fight back and we all need to be brave enough to reclaim our space and demand the respect and protection that every human being deserves. Uh, thank you very much and uh, have a good night. Thank you.